what do you, what have you said when people ask about the morality of this in that you know people say you're you're either playing god but i don't really care about that part so much but more of a this is amazing technology that could be potentially used in the wrong hands the wrong purposes or even accidentally be strange like what do you what do you what do you guys think of that and how do we control for that and what are your thoughts it's hard for me to imagine a scenario that's really dark um, about these technologies. I think the, the, the moral issue that people do get concerned about is animal welfare. And, um, you know, there are people that feel that it's immoral to have zoo animals in captivity, period. Um, and so, you know, I believe that um, more and more zoos worldwide are very focused on conservation. Uh, and in fact, they're a major contributor to conservation because very often the breeding of those animals that are done in zoos then get reintroduced to the wild. And so they're, they play a very important part of that, that conservation ecosystem. It can't happen without those animals in captivity. So I think it's always a question of, do you care about the individual animal more than the collective population or the collective species as a whole? Um, and so, yes, maybe and some animals may suffer individually through some of this process and in some of this experimentation. But if you're doing it in order to ensure that the population survives, um, I think you got to look at the, the greater good. The, the welfare issue is actually why we use the domestic ferret um, to clone Elizabeth Ann. It's why we use a domestic horse to clone the wild Chevalsky's foal is because domestic species have been living with human beings for thousands of years for the purposes we've bred them to do. Their welfare is well accounted for. Um, and, you know, it, it takes a surrogate mother. It takes an egg donor to make these animals. Um, black-footed ferret females are best used just breeding more offspring rather than being donors. So if you, so, that was the big reason why we go to a domestic species, something that we know we can give really great welfare to in captivity, and then bring a new valuable animal into an endangered species. But on that zoo concept that Ryan brings up, you know, if it wasn't for zoos and captive breeding, black-footed ferrets, condors, whooping cranes, kakapo would all be extinct today. The people behind this, when you really meet people working in zoos who do this and the people doing conservation, animal welfare issues of the individuals, they're at their, their hearts. Like people bond with these animals and, and they're doing an amazing job uh, today, unlike any generation before, to make sure that we can save species without incurring costs like uh but it but it's true there's a pragmatic aspect to it that we have to just at the end of the day say what do we pay to save a species and what is the value of an entire species worth and and in that realm there's a lot of people who have made a very strong moral obligation argument that because these species are in trouble from the things that we did either intentionally or unintentionally in ignorance or exploitation that we have to struggle with paying the cost to undo that harm. You know, we we've often uh, get this sort of challenging question of, you know, what about the unintended consequences? You know, what if it goes wrong? What if science doesn't get it right? Um, and uh, it, what we have seen is that this concept of unintended consequences is quite paralyzing for society. It basically <laughs> means don't do anything you don't fully understand. Don't do anything that, you know, you've got these unknown unknowns out there. Until you answer them, you can't proceed. And um, we did this amazing workshop. And at the end of the day, um, it became really clear that if we really want to help with the environment right now, if we really want to intervene, we have to actually start designing for intended consequences. What is it that we want to do that will be of benefit as opposed to being paralyzed by the things that we think are gonna be the greatest risk? So finding that balance is both a moral, cultural, economic shift for a lot of people to think through. Where do they put their time, their energy, their money for conservation? It's the biggest problem in politics is that we're too scared 
Well, if you do that, then what happens, right? It's one of the reasons we haven't yeah. done anything on climate change. It's like, because we're worried about hurting the companies or hurting X, Y, Z or changing things. Like, well, the reality is we're melting the planet, so we better do something. Yeah. So what, what does the future look like? What, and I, I, like, I'd love to talk about two, two pieces of that. What, what's exciting you? And then what, what could be scary, kind of like the unintended consequence? What are the downside risks that could be scary? Let's start with what's exciting you? What does this look like 10, 20 years from now, 50 years from now? What are we looking at? before talking about the next 20 to 50 to 100 years is we're living in an amazing future of conservation right now. Like getting back to this issue of intended and unintended consequences, people have been doing intended conservation for a long time. You can, we looked at just one, one part of conservation, just the movement of wildlife from a zoo to the wild, from one location to another. That's been going on for 125 years in the United States. And the track record is 99.99999% successfully beneficial. Unintended consequences that people have feared for decades and continue to fear just haven't bore out. Like the um, fear that they won't integrate, the tiger won't integrate back into the wild. Exactly. The right way These or fears whatever. have not bore out. Um, okay. uh, and, and, uh, and so looking to the future, if we look at just right now compared to where we were at the beginning of conservation, and you think of the amazing way we can bring in biotechnologies, we're living in a, in a world that is proof that conservationists do good work responsibly. They think about the risks and they mitigate and anticipate those. They save species. Um, and we take a lot of it for granted. You know, out here on the East Coast, <laughs> yeah. white-tailed deer are everywhere. 120 years ago, they were on the verge of extinction. And today they are a conservation success story. Nobody talks about that because that all happened before we ever had an Endangered Species Act, before we were, you know, really aware of all this stuff. So the history of conservation is we're already in it. You, you add biotechnology to that with the people behind the wheel that are good drivers of this. And there's so many amazing things we could do. Actually make sure that we don't lose coral reefs in the next 50 years. Bring back species into environments that are so valuable that you know that we've never been able to before that we can re-diversify the planet keep genetics going and really in my opinion create a future where there's equity and balance in how humans of every walk of life can enjoy and live in harmony every walk of their day with the millions of other species on this planet man i love that answer i think i'm learning here in some ways that if in order to be in the conservation business you kind of have to be some form of an optimist, you know, because it's such a forward-looking, futuristic, hope for a better future business industry. Yeah, I mean, well, if right? you think about it, <laughs> Oliver Ryder froze the will the cells of Willa 33 years ago with yeah. the hope they'd be used someday. You know, that's optimism to its that's core. Good. That's a good point. And that's conservation. It's it's about being pragmatic today with an optimistic spirit that you're going to win and you keep working until you win. And I think, Ryan, you know, if I can say for all of us, that's why intended consequences is such a huge paradigm shift that's important because if all you're thinking of is how can this go wrong and it's going to go wrong and we're doomed and you think in fear, you give up. And conservation has been a success story of perseverance that you keep going till you get success. That's how businesses are made. That's how politicians win uh, candidacies. That's how we save species. And biotech is going to give us ways to do that that we've never had the ability to do before. Um, and so, you know, I would love it if there was a flood of movies and TV shows that stopped peddling the dystopian future of biotechnology because <laughs> everyone we know using it is doing it to do something amazing and good in this world. And... And so when you ask, what are we scared of or what are the unintended consequences? I can't think of any that are serious because the nature of this field is about doing something that's going to have benefit. It's such a good point where it's, there's so much, there's not a lot of quick wins in your world. You know what I'm saying? Where it's like so much work and energy and trial and error. So like, let's talk about the, like the evil doer who's the bad guy in avatar who's mining the new planet for whatever or you know that's what like human beings think of and they think of this right uh, that human in your space is going to have a lot of barriers to prevent them from being the bad guy because it's so hard and time consuming um so uh, that actually is really uplifting
And ultimately, Zach, um, none of this technology goes forward without social license. Uh, mm. We have a regulatory environment. As soon as you're working with endangered species, it has to be complied with. Um, but, you know, increasingly what we're hearing throughout our culture right now is that um, people of all different walks of life bear relationship to nature, whether it's in their own backyard or it's out uh, at the top of a mountain somewhere when they're skiing. Everybody comes at it from a different perspective, and they all have a, a, a common right to care about what's going on in their environment. Allowing those voices to be heard, giving it permission for them to actually have a voice in how we interact with nature um, is going to be a real important part of the equation. And it's something that I think will build in this patience in a sense that you're calling for in conservation. It can't happen fast. Um, you know, these species have been on the planet for thousands of years. And what we want to do is keep them on this planet for the next millions of years. So to do that, um, we have to have the long the long-term thinking in place, the long goal.